um, we both recently graduated from St George's University um, and we've set up this series this year to um, teach finals and also other year groups just some key topics that will be really good summaries for your exams and um, we're going to try and include as many practice questions as we can do um, and we will have some sessions which will be just devoted to doing the practice questions and um, so give us a follow and see what we've got coming up uh, through the rest of the year so I see uh, quite a few of you here also tonight we've got um, Dr Nitesh who is um, working at the hospital with Ash um, he's an SHO and um, so he'll be helping teach at uh, the first session with us today all about respiratory medicine so I'll let Natish I'll let you start <clears throat> hello everyone I am Natish I'm one of the SHOs at Ealing Hospital so ready to start with the respiratory system and how we will do this is uh, before we cover any important break I'll just put in a question and you'll have uh, about 30 seconds to answer that question and then we'll go through that, that topic okay so let's start okay so let's start with the first case so in this case, Mrs. Brown came to the ED with her seven year old son, Jake. She says that Jake is having breathlessness and cough, which is on and off. And as a result of this the cough, he's, his sleep is also disturbed. Mr. Brown also tells you that uh, his, he, it's more frequent in the evening, uh, especially when he goes out to play. Uh, now you examine the uh, patient and on examination you see the patient is a uh, tachypneic uh, on percussion the chest is hyper resonant and there is wheeze on auscultation so what would be the most likely diagnosis just type in the chat box Okay, do we have the answers in the chat box? Uh, yeah, so a of shout outs for B. Yeah, I think there's a bit of a delay there as well sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. um, you can carry on if you want. It's fine. I can't see anything in the chat box. We've got a couple of people voting for B. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's correct. B is the correct answer. It is uh, because of the uh, asthma. It's probably because of the V's and uh, the hyper resonant chest and his uh, symptoms, which are more frequent in the evening that you guys selected asthma, which is correct. So what basically is asthma? It's basically a chronic lung disease that inflames and narrows the airways and it is the most common disease, a chronic disease among the children, chronic respiratory disease among the children. So this is a very key thing to note that it is more common in children. Yeah, so what are the symptoms? It usually presents with shortness of breath and cough, wheeze and chest tightness. So these being the key symptom. So what causes asthma? So basically the causes of asthma are not known. There's no particular thing. It is basically a, a symptom, a, a variety of factors that interact with one another which lead to this uh, condition. So most importantly, family history. So uh, in patients having parents with asthma or atopy, it is very important. So it is very important that you take his family history from patients with asthma. Also, the 
uh, the patients with asthma would usually have some history of uh, atopy like contact dermatitis or some eczema. And moreover, when you take a detailed background history from uh, the parents, they would tell that the child had some sort of uh, respiratory infection in the childhood when he was born, maybe RSV or something like that. OK, and yeah, and also when the patient's immune system is developed, the child's immune system is developing, uh, some exposure to allerg allergens could uh, lead to development of asthma. So how do we make the diagnosis? So first and foremost, the history. It's very important to take uh, history from uh, about the clinical symptoms, definitely, but also the family history, history of any allergies, and in particularly children, the birth history, how was the birth, and if there were any complication or any, uh, uh, if you any infections during that time. OK, and now on examination, you would uh, definitely, the key symptom is wheeze, so definitely wheeze, and also the rest, the chest would be hyper resonant because it's an obstructive disease. OK. Yeah, so what are the tests? How do we make the diagnosis uh, based on tests? So first and foremost being spirometry. So uh, for spirometry, what you do is uh, basically we take forced FEV1 and FVC, which is forced expiratory volume in the first second by, and divided by the forced vital capacity. So if it is less than 70%, it is basically um, it points towards asthma. And another thing that is very important would and would help you to differentiate it from other obstructive diseases is bronchodilator re reversibility. So in most of the patients with asthma, uh, after giving a bronchodilator, uh, you would see that the FEV1, the forced expiratory volume in the first second, would increase by 12% or more. And this is positive for asthma, and usually this happens in asthma. OK, and another very important text, uh, test is uh, fractional exhaled nitric oxide. So just a brief basis of this test, what happens is when there's an inflammation in the body, especially in endothelial cells or eosinophils, there's production of uh, nitric oxide from arginine. It's basically from uh, an enzyme called nitric oxide synthetase, and uh, which leads to uh, production of nitric oxide. So what we do is we just uh, uh, measure the concentration of nitric oxide in the exhaled uh, in the exhaled air from the patient. And if it is greater than 40 parts per billion, then it's considered positive for asthma and indicates there is probably an inflammation in the airways, which is causing the nitric oxide, which is called, which is the cause of asthma. OK. Oh, so this is the basically algorithm of how you diagnose asthma. So for children, as I told you, asthma is basically a disease of children. So we have very less threshold, uh, less threshold for diagnosing asthma. So what do I mean by that? So you do a spirometry and you see there is uh, FEV1 by FVC is less than 70% and you see there is uh, 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 and you give a bronchodilator and it is reversible. So definitely asthma as you see there's an obstructive lung disease and moreover it is getting reversed by bronchodilator so definitely asthma but if it doesn't get uh reversed by bronchodilator what you do is uh feno test so if it is greater than 35 parts per billion or 40 parts per billion then you refer for a specialist uh but no 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 if it is greater than that it's it more, it's more likely to be asthma and as i told you in the in the case we discussed uh, there is a variability in the peak flow readings what do what do we mean by that so as in the case we discussed the symptoms were more during the night or evening this is very typical of asthma so what we do is peak expiratory flow readings and uh, if we see the variability in that, it's probably asthma. So what's the difference in adults? So this is the algorithm for ad adults. I know it seems very complex, but for this, even if there is a reversible obstruction, uh, uh, I mean, if we give a bronchodilator and there is reversibility, we still can't say it's asthma. What we do is we go for uh, FENO levels, and if it is greater than 40, then we go for asthma. 
Okay, any questions still here? Okay. So what triggers asthma? Basically allergens, irritants, food and drinks, medicines, physical activity, as we discussed in the case, the physical activity, which is the child going out in evening, playing and getting the symptoms and the symptoms getting worse is probably the reason for uh, diagnosing asthma. You should think of asthma immediately if you hear a history like this. Ah, uh, yeah, upper respiratory infection. So what sometimes what you'll get is a history of a child who comes in with uh, symptoms of asthma. And when you take a detailed history, you will get to know that a few days back he had an upper respiratory tract infection. So it, it is very important to take a very good history for diagnosing an asthma. So yeah, how do we uh, measure asthma? How sway severity of asthma? So if the peak flow, what we do is a peak expiratory flow reading. If we see that the peak expiratory flow is more than 50 percent, and it, it's probably moderate asthma. If it is, uh, how do we say it's acute swear when it, the peak flow is between 33 and 50 50 percent? So and. Or, or there is an increased respiratory rate, which means 25, um, uh, greater than 25 per minute in people over 12 years, 30 per minute in children in children of ages 5 and 12, and 40 per minute in children between 2 and 5. And another thing we can do is check the pulse rate. If it is raised, we can say it's a acute severe asthma. Okay. So when do we say it is life threatening? So when the peak expiratory flow is less than 33% of the best predicted, it is uh, uh, life threatening or there is uh, oxygen saturation of less than 92% or the patient is not, not conscious, having an arrhythmia on ECG, or you see the patient is hypotensive or cyanosis, very important to see that uh, to check for cyanosis in asthma patient and also uh, for if you hear a silent chest, you don't hear wheeze or you don't hear the breath sounds. It's very alarming and you should think of life threatening asthma. So how do we treat it? So as we know, asthma is treated by inhalers. So what are the medications? So first of all, it's very important to recognize the triggers and just avoid them. And when we start the treatment, there are a number of drugs that we can consider. So for quick relief, we have Sabas. It is like a short acting beta agonist like Salbutamol, or we can have Samas, which is short acting muscarinic antagonist, which is uh, a protropium, or we can use oral or IV steroids. And for long term control for some patients, we are, if we are not able to get uh, good control control with quick relief. We usually prescribe them inhalers for long term. What, what do we use? We use is uh, inhaled steroids or uh, LTRs, leukotriene receptor modi uh, modifiers, or LAVAs, which is long acting beta agonist. So, how do we start the treatment? So, the patient comes to a GP and he diagnoses is diagnosed so the first line is just give a saba as a reliever therapy and see how the child responds to that usually most of the patients will be fine when and just, just tell them that it is the blue inhaler just tell them that whenever you get the symptoms and just take the inhaler and most of the patients are fine with that but in the patients who have symptoms more than thrice a week or are using their inhalers quite often or are uh, having to get up at night to take the inhaler, we usually go to the next line, which is starting with an inhaled corticosteroid, which is the first line maintenance therapy. And if and the next, uh, if if the patient is still having exacerbations or having to get up at night or having to uh, use the inhaler more than three times, the short acting one, more than three times, we go on to the next step, which is we add a uh, long leukotriene uh, receptor antagonist in it in addition to the steroid okay and then we treat a treatment uh, we just wait for four to eight weeks to take effect and if the asthma is still not controlled 
then we will just review the LTRA and add a LABA long acting beta agonist. Yeah. So if if still the asthma is uncontrolled and if the patient is still having exacerbations, so what we do is a uh, MART regimen. Uh, in this, we with a low maintenance dose of steroid in MART regimen, we give an inhaler which has a steroid as well as a SABA, and it will help you to uh, it will act as a reliever, reliever as well as a preventer inhaler. So it will you can take that inhaler whenever you get the symptoms, and also you can take that inhaler for a long term control. So life threatening or severe asthma. So this is very important. So when you're working in a you see your cases coming with a uh, severe asthma. So as we know, the first line uh, first line drug is ne giving nebulized salbutamol, which is five mill milligrams to all people. Sorry. All people aged uh, five and over and 2.5 to children is two to five. I would like to mention one thing. It has been seen from various trials and research that the extra 2.5, which are we are giving to people over five years, does not give any additional benefits. So what we tend to do is usually now in clinical practice, we usually give 2.5 because on the uh, that extra 2.5 only increases the heart rate without giving any extra benefit. But for exam purposes, it's five milligram of uh, nebulized salbutamol, and the next line is and yeah. Very important thing. Usually, the, uh, the patients with asthma would have uh, low saturation when they come with acute uh, life threatening asthma. So, what we do is we tend to give these nebulizers with oxygen and not air. So, with PEEP, and the next thing is uh, the next in line, if the patient is not responding, the next in line is ipratropium bromide, which is 500 micrograms and same give, given through oxygen. Uh, another thing, uh, if the uh, if it is still not controlled, what we do is give prednisolone, oral prednisolone. So it's very important to remember the dose for prednisolone. It's usually 40 milligrams for adults. So why I say it is important because uh, we give prednisolone in COPD as well, but the dose differs. So how I remember is for asthma because it is more of an inflammatory and allergic condition and steroids bring down the allergies and inflammation. So we give 40 milligrams while in COPD uh, it is less of a allergic condition. So we give lesser dose, which is 30 milligrams. Is it fine? Any questions regarding asthma? Should we go on to the next case? Yeah, there's no questions in the chat, so. OK. OK, so the next case. 66 year old male comes with breath and productive cough since a few months. So when you take the history, you get to know he's got hypertension and type 2 diabetes and you take the social history and you get to know he's a chronic smoker, alcoholic and lives alone. You do the examination. He's got tachypnea and sim similarly a hyper resonant chest on percussion and on auscultation you get a wheeze. So the OBS are as this uh, heart rate is 110. The respiratory rate is high. Blood pressure is 140 by 90. Temperature is 37 and oxygen saturation is 89%. So what would be your likely diagnosis? If you can just type, put the answers in the chat. Yeah. 
we hope quite a few people saying C. Yeah. OK, so yeah. Just so C is the correct answer. It is COPD. And uh, so let's go on with COPD. So what is basically COPD? Basically an inflammatory lung, again an inflammatory lung disease in which there is an obstruction of airways which is progressive, progressing, progressive being the keyword. And uh, another key thing, I, as I told you in asthma, it is only partially reversible by bronchodilators, while asthma it is reversible by bronchodilators to a greater extent. So what is basically a difference? How do you differentiate between COPD and asthma is basically with the age and the history of smoking. So uh, COPD is of two types, uh, chronic bronchitis and emphysema. So chronic bronchitis, it is basically a persistent cough with the sputum greater than three months for a year for two years. It means you need to have a chronic cough for three months in a year and in, the, in two consecutive years for it to be diagnosed as chronic bronchitis. In, in emphysema, there is basically the permanent enlargement of air spaces distal to the terminal bronchiole which is because of the septal destruction, cellular septal destruction. So how do the cases present? So it's basically uh, um, 1950s or 60s or with a wheeze and chronic cough and uh, sputum production being the key. And uh, the, you'll get a history that it gets worse in the winters. And there's definitely there will be a history of smoking for a long term. And uh, what do we see on uh, examination? We see that they are pink puffers or blue bloaters. We'll talk this. Uh, we'll talk about this a bit later. And you'll see that the patient is in uh, respiratory distress. And uh, because it is an obstructive disease, the, the basically what is happening is air is not getting out of the lungs completely. So it will uh, the patient will have a lot of air in his lungs, which will lead to the hyper expansion and the lungs being hyper resonant and uh, prolonged expiration because all, obviously there's an obstruction and you'll hear a wheeze. So this is a very good picture. So to remember for the exams as well as for clinical cases that uh, how chronic chronic bronchitis presents and how emphysema presents. So with emphysema, you'll see a thin gentleman with uh, a pinkish tone of skin and would be older and would have quite severe dyspnea. You can you can definitely just tell by seeing a patient that he's got emphysema. He'll be very thin and have a hyperinflated lungs and uh, very hyper resonant uh, on percussion. And with chronic bronchitis, you'll see an overweight gentleman with uh, cyanosis and peripheral edema and uh, ronchi. There, there would be ronchi and V's on auscultation. Okay. So how do we investigate? So spirometry is again uh, the gold standard. So the key thing is the FEV1 by FVC after bronchodilator would still be less than 70, which is 70%, which is less than 0.7. So this is the key to differentiate the it from asthma, but obviously you can differentiate from history. Asthma is more common in children and COPD more common in adults. And you can do is uh, sputum culture. You can do the bloods to see why the uh, COPD has been exacerbated. When the patient comes, you need to do the ABG. And uh, uh, very important is chest X-ray. On chest X-ray, you will see uh, enlarged lungs, hyperinflated, and very uh, uh, black on appearance. You need to do an ECG to check the heart and imaging, which will uh, a CT scan, which is not routinely done for the just making the diet. And ABG is very key uh, investigation over here. So how do we manage uh, COPD? So first and foremost is smoking sensation, and then we go with the uh, inhalers. So what options we have is Saba, which is uh, short acting beta agonist and Sama short uh, acting muscarinic uh, antagonist and uh, the steroids. 
So you, we usually start the patients on a combination therapy when a new patient has come. So what we do is uh, we usually start with the uh, Lama and Laba for a patients who do not have asthmatic features. So what do I mean by asthmatic features? Asthmatic features like atopy or a history of asthma in childhood, history of asthma in family. So if we don't see any features uh, suggesting asthma, then we don't start with steroids. As I've already told you, steroids are reserved for allergic and more inflammatory conditions. So we usually tend to avoid steroids as first line for patients in COPD and we start them on, on uh, Lama and Lava. So for uh, patients who have uh, confirmed COPD and uh, asthmatic features like ATOP and family history and uh, eczema or childhood history, then we start them with LABA and steroids. Okay, so what we do is if the patient is not being controlled on LABA and LAMA or the patient is not being controlled on LAMA and steroids, we start the other agent and we start on combined triple therapy which is LABA plus LAMA plus inhaled corticosteroids. Okay, so usually we don't give oral corticosteroids just for as a COPD. What we do is we only give steroids when there is an acute exacerbation. And uh, we only use uh, oral theophile is also used, but not routinely used. Only for people who are not able to take the inhaled therapy, we used oral theophylline. Oral mucolytic agents could be helpful in patients who have a very productive cuff and on auscultation, you have a very thick wheeze. And uh, you can, I mean, when you see a patient with uh, COPD and having a chronic productive cuff, you can hear, hear the sputum being thick. So we give mucolytic therapy for that. And Antibiotics. So this is very important. So hold antibiotics unless you don't, uh, unless you see an infection. This is very important. What we routinely see is patients of COPD getting antibiotics just because they have an exacerbation. People having exacerbation doesn't mean it's an infective exacerbation. You need to see if they're having any fever, if the blood show raised inflammatory markers, white cells are raised, CRP is raised, only then we start antibiotics. We don't usually give routine antibiotics for just an exacerbation. We need to see if it is an effective exercise and exacerbation. Another important thing is long term oxygen therapy. So it can be given for patients because the, these patients will have a low, low oxygen saturation. So we can give a long term oxygen therapy but it should be only reserved for few cases as giving extra um, as we always treat oxygen as a drug and giving extra oxygen can lead to more harm than benefit so whom do we give the long-term oxygen therapy for the patients who are having fev1 below 30 percent who you can see cyanosis on the skin and very important polycythemia so when patients have low oxygen saturation they would say they tend to produce more rbcs and they to compensate and they have polycythemia for such patients definitely consider long-term oxygen therapy peripheral edema raised gvp or oxygen saturations uh low oxygen saturation we give uh, oxygen therapy okay so these are just the numbers to tell you when to start the oxygen therapy. So now you see this gentleman in A&E and you do an ABG and find the following results for this gentleman. What do you think is going on? Just type in the chat. Okay, you have 30 seconds. What do you interpret from this ABG? So um, a respiratory acidosis, got type 2 rest failure, a chronic respiratory acidosis with metabolic compensation. Mm -hmm. 
that's very good okay so yes it is correct the patient is having uh, respiratory acidosis and type 2 respiratory basically patient is having type 2 respiratory failure so what what do we say is type 2 respiratory failure so respiratory failures are of two type type 1 and type 2 so basically in type 2 a respiratory failure the patient is not hypercapnic and patient just has a low pao2 with normal pacio2 and uh, in type 2 failure, you will see there is a low oxygen uh, levels as well as a raised CO2 levels. So it is very important to recognize uh, to differentiate type 1 from type 2 as the treatment would differ for both. And most importantly, the amount of oxygen that is delivered will differ for both. So uh, type 1 respiratory failure is more associated with acute diseases of lungs, basically like pulmonary edema, pneumonia, pulmonary hemorrhage or collapse. So in type 2 respiratory failure, there is a failure of alveolar, alveolar ventilation and as a result, the CO2 is not excreted, which leads to its accumulation. So all the diseases that prevent the proper alveolar ventilation like COPD, neuromuscular disorders which would lead to less expansion and of the lungs uh, drug overdose which would decrease the respiratory rates and chest wall deformities which would decrease the lung volumes would lead to type 2 failure and lead to raised uh, carbon dioxide in the blood so for type 2 respiratory failure we usually give controlled oxygen and don't usually put the patient on uh, 15 liter of straight away what we do is we do uh, give the patient uh, controlled oxygen to make the to, to keep the saturations between 88 to 92 percent and if still the patient's respiratory uh, if acidosis is not corrected we go for a bypass which is and, and assisted ventilation so let's go on to the next case so this is a 56 year old female presents to you with complaint of her pain in her left leg since one day on examination the left leg is tender and swollen uh, com considerably swollen compared to the right leg she denies any trauma and she recently traveled from australia after visiting her son so what do you think is the diagnosis B. Okay. Yeah. So B is the correct answer. So the patient has a DVD. Uh, we can tell that because of the travel history, uh, being uh, sitting for a long time in a plane would probably lead to stagnancy, uh, stasis of blood in her leg, and cause DVD. So what is DVT? It is basically blocking in blood flow uh, in one or more of your veins in your leg uh, because of a clot. So what are the signs and symptoms? The patient will come with uh, throbbing or cramping pain in one leg. Rarely you would see DVT of both legs. It's usually one leg. So if you're thinking DVT of both legs, probably think of any other diagnosis as well because it rarely happens in both legs. So what you will see is a warm skin around the painful area. The skin would be red and uh, you could see the swollen veins, which would be very sore. The patient, when you touch the leg, the, you could tell it's a DVD. When you touch the leg or you just press the leg, the patient will shout with pain. So what we do is for, for just for clinical diagnosis, we do well scoring. So this basically takes in consideration all the clinical points patient has any active cancer any paralysis or has been bedridden uh, 
or localized tenderness and we score score according to these points. So if the patient scores two or more points, it's easy. so what we do is a D dimer and a proximal leg vein ultrasound. And if it is positive, so if the ultrasound is positive, this definitely is anticoagulation. And if it is contraindicated, having bleeding tendencies or having bleeding disorders, anticoagulation might be contraindicated. For such cases, we usually do a mechanical intervention, which is basically a surgical intervention to take out the clot. And if the and uh, if the, the, the uh, negative, if it is the ultrasound is negative and the D dimer is positive, it's probably not a DVT and probably the D dimer is because of anything else. It could be an infection, it could be sepsis, it could be a kidney condition which has caused the raised, TV, uh, raised D dimers. And we would stop uh, therapy, uh, we will stop the anticoagulation and repeat the ultrasound in si uh, six to eight days later. Okay, so. So if the uh, if, if the one point or less, it's probably not a DVT, and, and uh, we repeat the D dimer. We do a D dimer test, and within four hours, if D dimer is negative, then it's definitely not DVT. Positive, then we start the anti. We will consider the anticoagulation, and uh, we will do a proximal leg ultrasound. So that ends DVT. Let's go on to the next case. So this is 18 year old presents to you with shortness of breath and chest pain, breathing, uh, shortness of breath, chest pain, and coughing up blood. On examination, the patient is tachypneic te and he also complains of some soreness in his uh, right leg. When you take a history he claims that he has discovered that he is not comfortable with his body and gender and recently took some uh, estrogen pills which he ordered online so what do you think would be the likely diagnosis Um, a few D's so far. D, yeah. So D is correct. So it's probably so P is pulmonary embolism. It is probably because of these estrogen pills, which would cause a hypercoagulable state, which would cause the pain in the right leg, as well as the shortness of breath. So. PE usually occurs along with DVT. So usually in patients with PE, you would get a history from with uh, a history of DVT. And because usually lungs act as a filter and for the venous system, and whenever a clot breaks from the uh, deep veins of the leg, it goes to the lungs where it uh, gets lodged and causes the pulmonary embolism. And it causes the blockage to the supply of lung and leading to the heart failure because of the back pressure changes. So very important, treating uh, DVT prevents PE. It usually occurs because of uh, clot breaking from the leg and going to the lungs and not from just uh, it doesn't the clot doesn't usually form in the lungs. It usually comes from somewhere else. So what you will see is patient having shortness of breath, most common symptom, chest pain, and the patient would complain that whenever he breathes or takes a deep breath, the chest 
the pain gets worse. The patient will have anxiety, a feeling of dizziness. On when you do an ECG, you'll see uh, the patient will complain of palpitations as well. And you do an ECG, and you'll see irregular heartbeat, probably an AF. And the patient will be coughing up blood. So very typical history is coughing up streaks of blood would be typical history. The patient would be very anxious and sweating. So what we do is again well scoring. This is based on clinical uh, symptoms. And if the patient is having the like our patient is having some soreness in leg would be uh, point to DVT. And would give him a score of three. Directly. So if the score is less than four, the PE is unlikely. If it is greater than four, it's probably a PE. So what we do is for a patient with the a CTPA right away. So CTPA is what uh, similar to the ultrasound we did in DVT. So usually with the high well score, we'll do a CTPA immediately and uh, yeah, so in some patients we can't do a CTPA because of allergy or contrast media or would have a very bad renal function with CKD and high risk of radiation. So we usually do a ventilation perfusion scan for these patients. If we are not able to do CTPA. So if we identify CTPA, uh, we try a PE on CTPA. We start with the anticoagulation, and if, uh, as discussed earlier, if anticoagulated, patients having bleeding tendencies, then we give uh, uh, we we go for a mechanical intervention to take out the clot. So if we, uh, if the PE is not identified on CPA, we usually do a leg ultrasound to see if there's any DVT. If DVT is not suspected, then we just stop the anticoagulation and think about anything else. So basically, we do D-dimer as a first line, and D-dimer, as I told you, is a non-specific test, so could be raised in many conditions. So if the D-dimer is positive, just say it's a PE or do a CTPA or a leg ultrasound to confirm our diagnosis. As you can say, it's probably not a PE or a DVT, and we would stop stop the anticoagulation. And if if CTPA is negative, we can definitely say it is not a PE, and we would go for a ultrasound to see any DVT. And if it is not a DVT, then we will stop the anticoagulation. Okay. Any questions still here? No, can't see any questions in the chat. OK, so the next case. So 60 year old male came with a background of hypertension and diabetes presented to the OPD with a high grade fever. He had right sided chest pain and cough uh, with a rusty sputum for one week. His OBS show a heart rate of 120, respiratory rate of 24, saturation of 90 percent, blood pressure of 140 by 95, temperature of 38. His bloods show a white cell count of 15.3 and CR 300. Chest X is still awaited. So, what would be your provisional diagnosis? So you got people saying pneumonia, so it's option mm -hmm. three. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yes, it is correct. It is pneumonia. What is pneumonia? It is basically inflammation and consolidation due to an infectious agent. So key word being consolidation. Consolidation. It is in basically in duration of a normally irritated lung tissue due to presence of a cellular exudative in so pneumonia could be an infection of one lung or both the lungs 
and it causes inflammation in the alveoli and alveoli are just filled with pus making it difficult to breathe. Okay. So what are the risk factors? Cigarette smoking, very important risk factor. So usually in pneumonia, we see in elderly people and they would have definitely a cigarette smoking history. Upper respiratory tract, and they would have a recently have had a upper respiratory tract infection. Uh, would be on steroids, which would decrease their immunity. And as I told you, elderly people, uh, recent infections or any pre-existing lung disease. So it's very important. Patients with COPD usually present with pneumonia, and the infective exacerbation of COPD is because of this pneumonia. So yeah, any patients with uh, who are immunosuppressed with steroids, diabetes, or malignancies. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very important thing bacteremia. So, if a patient who is in the hospital admitted with a UTI and develops a cough and is also or is also coughing and suspect pneumonia, it is probably because of the sepsis, because of UTI, which caused the uh, bacteria in the blood, which travel to the lungs and cause the pneumonia. So it is very important. So patients with any pre-existing infections developing cough or new respiratory symptom, think of uh, think of pneumonia. So how do we classify it as either uh, community acquired or uh, nasocomial or in immunocom immunocompromised individual? So what is community community acquired? So this patient for uh, 14 days prior to developing the symptoms is a hard problem infection in community. It could be typical, atypical or aspiration. So typical is usually with the typical organisms, which is uh, probably uh, pneumococcus or influenza, which causes the uh, typical infections. Atypical inf uh, infections are uh, bacteria like Legionella and Another one is aspiration, which is probably an elderly patient who is being fed at home, getting an aspiration because of eating while lying down or probably not a good cough, cough reflex. Nasocomia, so it is very important. It can be HAP, which is a hospital acquired pneumonia at, and occurs 48 hours or more. This is very important. So the patient has to have, be in hospital for 48 hours or more and um, uh, to have and developing after 48 hours, new respiratory symptoms after 48 hours. So and VAP, VAP is uh, ventilator associated pneumonia. So when the patient is uh, intubated on ventilation and after 42, 8 to 72 hours, you see the inflammatory markers rising, patient uh, becoming febrile, think of uh, pneumonia. Uh, HC cap. So it is basically a patient in a nursing home or a long term facility, long term care facility. Usually patients with nursing home develop uh, this type of uh, pneumonia, usually because they are elderly, you know, compromised, getting infection from other people who are probably healthy and not developing such serious infections. So what would be the symptoms? It's very important high grade fever. Whenever you see a patient with respiratory symptoms and high grade fever, it's infection, which is pneumonia. Patient would have a productive cough, having sputum, green colored, yellow colored, rusty, pleuritic chest pain. What do we mean by pleuritic chest pain? It's basically a chest pain, which increases more on breathing and patient having a breathlessness, sharp or stabbing pain, excessive sweating, a clammy skin, and loss of appetite, fatigue, confusion, which is very important in elderly people. Elderly people usually develop pneumonia, develop delirium and become confused. So they can't give you proper history of their respiratory symptoms. So patient, uh, an elderly patient coming in with confusion, think of UTI or pneumonia as the cause of their confusion. So yeah, what would you would see is patient it is febrile uh, on the uh, tachypnea, tachycardia, sinuses is very important in elderly uh, hypotension, altered sensorium, use of accessory muscles, and confusion, which is very important in elderly people. It is one of the common signs. Uh, 
So what, how would the consolidation feel on examination? So as I told you, consolidation is basically an induration and alveoli getting filled with pass. So it would be dull on percussion. Bronchial, uh, the breath sounds would be bronchial and you would hear crackle, whispering pectoral leaky and a pleural rap. So how do we investigate? We start with the basic investigations, which is a full blood count, electrolytes, ECG, creatinine, oxygen saturation, ABG, and the most important investigation is chest X-ray. So to diagnose a pneumonia, you need to have a consolidation on chest X-ray. So this is how a consolidation looks like on an X-ray. It is a lobar con a consolidation. So how do we decide how to treat the patient? We see the CURB 65 score, which is confusion, blood urea nitrogen, and respiratory rate, blood pressure, and age. If uh, CURB score is zero to one, then you can treat, it the, treat the patient on oral antibiotics and as an outpatient. If he develops, uh, if the score is two, then you probably need to keep the patient inpatient and give him uh, IV antibiotics. And if the CURB score is greater than three, the patient would probably need ICU interventions. So yeah. So how do we treat? So for, oh, sorry. So treatment. So we start with the symptomatic treatment, which is controlling the fever and the oxygen saturation. We give oxygen and uh, give paracetamol for the fever. So first line of anti first uh, choice of oral antibiotics is amoxicillin, which cover which is a broad spectrum and covers most of the bacteria. And uh, if the patient is having uh, moderate severity, then we start with amoxicillin uh, with clarithromycin. And uh, clarithromycin basically covers the atypical organisms. And uh, if the patient is having high severity, then we start with IV for five days, uh, Comox for five days, uh, three times a day, and clarithromycin twi uh, twice a day, IV. So, but basically for, tra uh, for the uh, treatment for pneumonia, always look for your trust guidelines for the choice of antibiotics. It differs from trust to trust. Okay, so any questions? I can't see anything on the chat questions wise. I'm gonna start off with a question for you. So 35 year old man comes into a &E with shortness of breath and chest pain. His SATs are 85% on air. He's got no underlying health conditions and he's not on any medication. And when you examine him, he's a tall, slim man. He's quite pale at the moment and he's working hard to breathe using accessory muscles. You listen to his chest and he's got reduced air entry on the left upper lobe. And what would be your top differential? So I'll give you 30 seconds to pop your answers in the chat. <clears throat> okay. So we've got some bees. Some B's, lovely. Yep, yeah, indeed. So B is the correct answer. So pneumothorax is, is basically another word for a collapse of the lung and it can be either primary pneumothorax, so a person like this man who's got no medical history. Um, quite often in medical textbook scenarios you'll get this stereotypical tall thin man um, as more likely to have a pneumothorax. Um, but it can also be secondary, so that's due to an underlying lung disease, particularly things like emphysema, like Nitish talked about, um, where you've got air spaces already in the lung. And if you've got those sort of peripherally around the edge, they can burst and lead to a pneumothorax. Presentation is a sudden, on, sudden onset shortness of breath. So if you think about it, you've got this sudden bursting and you've got the lung collapsing. So all of a sudden you'll get shortness of breath 
uh, pain in the pleura. So pleuritic chest pain is generally worse on inspiration and hypoxia. So primary pneumothorax, um, risk factors include being tall, male, or having certain underlying connective tissue diseases. So Marfan syndrome is one. Marfan syndrome is um, people are often characteristically very tall and very slender, um, and they have quite long fingers and hands. <clears throat> Secondary pneumothorax is due to underlying lung disease, particularly, as I mentioned before, a ruptured bullet in COPD. So the first line investigation of a pneumothorax is a chest x-ray. And this chest x-ray here is, is a really good one, but they're not always quite as obvious as this. So you can see where the arrows are on the right hand side. Um, and you can see right at the edge there, you've got a line, which is the actual lung itself. And then the very dark black space with no air markings. And that's the thing to look for. So if you can't see, those little airway lines going all the way to the edge, then suspect a pneumothorax. And very small ones tend to be at the apex of the lung. So we always have a look up at the top first. Um, so another investigation, seeing a patient in A&E, if, if someone's hypoxic, you probably want to do an ABG. <clears throat> and examining their chest, um, you'll get hyper resonance on the affected side because um, you've got that dead space there and also reduced breath sounds because there's no lung there where you're listening. So the management of a pneumothorax, so if it's primary pneumothorax, so no previous medical history, and it's also very small, we can actually manage this conservatively. So you can send the patient home with sort of strong safety netting advice um, and then follow them up in clinic uh, with a repeat chest X-ray in a few months time. Um, if it's a secondary pneumothorax uh, or if it's primary but it's large, um, you need to aspirate it. So literally um, insert a large needle with a syringe into that triangle of safety, which you can see on the picture there, um, and pull the air out into the syringe. Uh, but after that, you will also need to insert a chest drain. I think I've got a picture of one of those coming up on another slide, um, which sort of helps while that hole in the lung heals up, um, the chest drain will work on getting rid of that air. Um, the triangle of safety is used because it's the best place to not damage the lung or any other organs such as the heart. Um, and you must always repeat the chest x-ray after inserting a drain and removing one to make sure that it's in the right place. You've also got what we call a tension pneumothorax. So this is um, a medical emergency. Um, patients acutely, acutely breathless and hypoxic. So it's quite a similar scenario to <coughs> your regular pneumothorax. Um, however, in this case, the key feature is that the trachea will deviate and it deviates away from a tension pneumothorax. Um, tension pneumothorax is basically a one way valve. So if we imagine, for example, a traumatic injury to the chest where perhaps someone's stuck a, a knife or something into the side of the thorax um, and you've got a hole there, you get this one-way valve sort of sucking effect where air from outside is being sucked into the pleural space, but there's no place for the air to escape. And so that air will just build up and build up and eventually will put pressure on the heart. And then that in itself causes decreased cardiac output. Um, there's not really any time for any investigations. If you see somebody in this situation with a rapidly um, increasing hypoxia and breathlessness and a deviated trachea, you need to treat them immediately. If you do get time to an ECG, you may see some PR elevation, um, but there's definitely no time to get a chest x-ray. So an emergency decompression is required. So rather than using the triangle of safety, you've got here on this diagram, uh, you use your second intercostal space at the mid clavicular line, so level with um, the nipple, and you insert probably the largest cannula you can find, an orange or a grey, remove the needle, let the air escape, and it will hiss as it escapes. Uh, and that gives you time to sort of stabilise the heart and think about a more permanent solution, so putting a chest strain in. Ah. So sorry, I'm mistaken. I don't actually have a picture of a chest strain here. So chest strain is it's basically you put the needle in in the triangle of safety 
uh, and you get a plastic tube then coming out of um, the side of the chest and it drains into like a tall cylindrical bucket. Um, <clears throat> it can also be used for effusions as well. Um, and sort of that will help um, help the lung while the hole in the lung heals up and the pneumothorax resolves. Okay, so our next scenario is a 75 year old man who's visiting the GP. So he has a six month history of 10 kilos of unintentional weight loss, so a great deal of weight that he's lost. He's got reduced appetite, he's got night sweats, and he's been coughing up blood on and off for the last week. He also feels constantly exhausted and dizzy. So the GP's done some bloods and he's noticed the following. So his sodium is 126. Normal range for sodium is between 105, 135 and 145. So this one's quite low. So what's the most likely underlying cause for his symptoms? Yeah, we've got a couple of people have gone for A. <clears throat> yeah, so indeed, so the answer is A. You guys are right. So we'll go on to why it's A in a moment, but um, the story that we're getting at here is lung cancer. So lung cancer is probably out of, of all of the various cancers it's the cancer that's most commonly tied to an environmental cause so um over 90 percent of cases of lung cancer are directly related to smoking cigarettes uh, and the presentation is um a cough with bleeding uh, a cough that's chronic goes on for months at a time weight loss night sweats people can also get a hoarse voice so uh, the recurrent laryngeal nerve which travels up um, across the thorax can get impinged by apical tumours. Um, this can also affect people swallowing as well. Um, lung cancer is broadly divided into non-small cell and small cell tumours and this is just based on their histology. So non-small cell tumours are the most common <clears throat> um, and these are, there's a few different subtypes of these as well but they're generally carcinomas which originate from epithelial cells in the airways. And then you've got this very nasty small cell um, lung cancer as well, which is a high grade neuroendocrine carcinoma. It's got a very poor prognosis um, without treatment. It's it's weeks or less and it's associated with what we call paraneoplastic syndrome. So um, many different types of paraneoplastic syndrome, but a common one associated with lung cancer is uh, SIADH or um, secretion of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. So this, going back to the question that we had, um, SIADH um, causes low sodium and paraneoplastic syndromes are most commonly associated with small cell lung cancers. So investigations wise, so a person might come into A&E uh, with breathlessness or a cough or with bleeding uh, in a cough and they might first, when they walk in the door, get a chest X-ray. So like this chest X-ray here, you can see that uh, right-sided apical mass there, um, which looks pretty suspicious. You know, it's it's quite large. It's um, it's not patchy like a pneumonia would look. Um, but also we can't definitively just from that image say that this is a lung cancer. So we need to further investigate with a CT scan. Um, so this gives us a better picture of that mass and may also show us uh, local metastases. So in the vertebrae, particularly or the pleura. We then need to biopsy the mass. So uh, tumours that are located around the hilum can be sampled with bronchoscopy. So putting a camera down into the lungs and um, taking a sample of the mass. Sometimes you can literally see it there on the camera or you can do uh, what we call a washing. So you flush the airways with saline. It's it's very unpleasant for the patient, but it's fortunately quite quick 
um, and the fluid then that we suck back out that we've used to wash um, often has malignant cells within it. Um, but if it's a tumour that's right down at the periphery or at the base, it may be better to do it um, via the skin, via a needle aspiration. Um, and then once we've got the biopsy, we can find out what sort of cancer this might be. Um, and the biopsy together with the images allows us to stage the cancer via the TNM system, tumour node metastasis. And then in terms of management, so um, if the tumour is confined to one lobe of the lung, uh, the patient may be suitable if they're otherwise quite well, um, they might be suitable to have a lobectomy. So in your OSCEs, if you're examining people, um, if you make sure when you're examining the chest to look at the sides of the chest for any scars, um, lobectomy scars are often at the side of the chest. Um, however, tumours that involve multiple lobes or if there is metastasis, unfortunately, are not suitable for surgical resection. Um, but they may be suitable for some sorts of chemo and radiotherapy. And also it's important to remember that the lung is a common site uh, for other cancers to metastasize, so things like renal cell carcinoma or breast cancer. Okay, any questions so far, guys? Uh, there's nothing in the chat so far. Okay, lovely. So, OK, so my next topic I'm going to come on to is um, pleural fusion and pleural disease. So um, a good sort of move on from lung cancer, because lung cancer can be associated with effusions, for sure. So a pleural effusion is basically a collection of fluid uh, that gathers within the pleural space. And the fluid can be classed as either exudate or transudate. Um, <clears throat> This can be sort of a transudate is basically a fluid that's caused by either increased hydrostatic or low plasma oncotic pressure. So things like heart failure, uh, where you've got fluid overload, you might have chronic liver disease with low albumin and so uh, a low oncotic pressure that causes that fluid to leak out from the vessels into the pleural space. Um, or it can be an exudate. So an exudate is produced by something, is how I remember it. So things like infections or malignancies. Presentation of effusion is a progressive shortness of breath, orthopnea. So the person might say that um, they can't lie flat at night, they need some pillows to prop them up. And also pleuritic pain, which is worse on inspiration. So we've got this nice uh, cartoon here that sort of summarises this. So got your transudate on the left um, and some more causes there. Nephrotic syndrome is another one, renal causes. Um, and on the right, your exudates <coughs> um, cause also by things like TB um, or autoimmune disorders. So investigation wise, so again, um, when a person comes into a &E and they're very breathless, the first thing you're going to get them is chest X-ray. So you can see that quite large diffusion there on the left side. And you can also see how the trachea is deviating away from that effusion slightly. Um, <clears throat> and large effusions do tend to cause that, but they have to be pretty large. Um, and then after that, we might use an ultrasound. So uh, that's normally to assist in inserting a chest drain and making sure that we get right in the, um, the right area to drain that effusion. Uh, and again, we use a drain that's inserted within the safe triangle. Um, sometimes if people have got uh, metastatic cancers, particularly breast cancer, it's quite common to get recurrent effusions. Um, and we can treat this with something called pleuridesis, which is literally um, the person has a chest drain in and then we pump talcum powder. So a sterile talcum powder is pumped through the drain into the pleural space and it literally sticks the pleura to the wall of thorax um, and prevents that fluid from building up again. It's got about a 70% 70, 70 success rate, um, but it's very painful for the patient. Um, and in order to do a pleurodesis, you basically need to make sure that there's as little effusion left there as possible before you put the talc in. Otherwise, the sticking doesn't work very well. And then a uh, pleural disease um, specifically, it's commonly related to asbestos. So asbestos 
is a fine powdery material that used to be used a lot in building work and um, actually more recently than than we would think so pre 1990s or even the start of the 90s um, and was often used to make this fireproof material that was put in walls and ceilings um, and it's fine when it's used as a solid board but when it's actually broken apart or damaged you get these tiny little fibers that if inhaled are a, are a carcinogen so it's now no longer used in building work but there's still a lot of old buildings around that might contain it um, so asbestosis is not a cancer but it causes um, these hard plaques on the pleura and it can also cause symptoms so things like shortness of breath, cough, wheeze, fatigue and chest pain and then you've also got mesothelioma which is a cancer and it's very aggressive cancer of the pleura directly related to asbestos and the pleura becomes hard and thickened over time and unfortunately it it encases the lungs in this really hard pleura um, which causes deterioration in a short period of time. There's not many effective treatments for mesothelioma um, and on a chest x-ray you can see this quite typical picture on the left upper lobe there you can see that kind of thumb printing um, which is a sign of the cancer invading the pleura. Okay so Next, so we'll move away from the lung cancer and next I'm going forward to talk about TB. So TB um, is infection caused by Mycobacterium tuberculosis and it's very common worldwide but also has really rising rates in the UK, particularly in um, certain areas of London um, and it's particularly common in sort of deprived or very cramped areas of living um, with high migrant populations, also quite common um, in homeless populations as well. Um, presentation includes a productive cough, uh, blood in coughing, night sweats and fevers. So you can imagine that a differential for these sort of symptoms would be a lung cancer. Um, but also if you think about risk factors for TB and also tends to occur in younger people, whereas cancer is uh, more of an older person's disease. Um, once infected with TB, <clears throat> a person might become immediately acutely unwell with disseminated disease and this is more likely if they're already ill with something else, if they're elderly or if they've got a weak immune system. Alternatively though and a lot more commonly, uh, TB will enter this latent phase where it's contained by the immune system but could reactivate at a later stage. So on the top here, this chest x-ray is what we call disseminated TB. So this is a person who um, in their first acute infection has developed this widespread disease. Um, they've got a very high mortality, unfortunately. Um, however, this second x-ray down here, you can see that little um, that lump there by the right hilum. Um, so that is what we call a gone focus. And here at the bottom is sort of a a detailed picture of what a gone focus involves. So you've got all of the immune cells forming this ring around the TB bacteria and you can see them right in the middle there. And the idea is that they're contained in there, surrounded by this granulomatous or scarring tissue. Um, however, if the immune system becomes weak at some point, for example, if the person um, starts certain medications or chemotherapy, um, these bacteria can reactivate and the person can become unwell. So investigations for suspected TB, so um, three separate sputum samples which need to be taken in the morning. Um, <clears throat> the bacteria can then be identified under a microscope and they're stained with zeal Nielsen stain which is a particular sort of chemical stain um, because TB has this very hard outer casing around the bacteria, a hard wall, um, so it's hard to stain it with, with other things apart from Zill Nielsen. Um, so that's um, seen as a positive result of a test. You can also grow TB but it can take several weeks um, and obviously you need to treat the person before that. But the culture might be useful if you're thinking about um, resistance and what antibiotics the bacteria are sensitive to. OK, so the next question. So which of these is the correct regimen for 
treating TB? So I'll give you a minute to answer that in the chat. Right, I know all of these options look quite similar. Okay, we've got somebody here saying B. Maybe give it a bit more time. Yep. Um. Okay. So. Okay, so it uh, it's worded a little bit difficultly, but but this is the right answer. So B. So really, what the treatment for TB involves is all four drugs for the first two months. So, so we've got this acronym called RIPE, um, which I think I'll go on to explain in a later slide. So, Rupampazin, Isonized, Pyrazinamide and Ethambutol are all used together for two months. And then a further four months, so six months in total, of just Rupampazin and Isonized. Okay, so, the next question, so the patient's been treated for TB and they come in a month later after starting their treatment and they're complaining of eye pain, uh, particularly on movements and also some visual changes. So which drug is most likely the cause of their symptoms? Yes. You're getting PDs. Okay. Yep. Yes. Very good. So it is ethambutol. So, oh, make sure that your mic's off, guys. I think someone's mic's on a little bit. Great. So there's four antibiotics, uh, this RIPE regimen. So RIPE all together for two months, RI for a further four months, TB is notifiable disease, and any patient that, um, that you don't think might comply with the treatment or it might be difficult for them to comply with the treatment and um, you can ask them to complete DOT so um, getting them to come in and take their medication in a medical setting in front of a doctor and then the side effects of these drugs are some really important ones to learn for exams so back to the question that we just answered D ethambutol was the correct answer um, Ethambutol can cause optic neuritis, which would present as eye pain, particularly on movement uh, and photophobia. Um, you can also have um, high uric acid, which can cause things like gout. Uh, rifampicin typically causes orange secretion, so people might cry orange tears or sweat orange sweat. Um, but it's also an enzyme inducer, so it's important to recognise that other medications things like antibiotics, things like warfarin, um, it sort of metabolises these more quickly. So it means that there's a more potent concentration of these drugs in the system more quickly. So you've got to be very careful what you pair it up with. Um, I guess if the person's got TB, the priority is going to be treating their TB. So if all possible, sort of reducing or stopping other medications they're on would probably be the best option. Um, isoniazid uh, typically causes peripheral neuropathy, so things like tingling and painful sensations in the hands and feet. So we give it with pyridoxine as a prophylaxis to try and stop this. Um, and it's also quite damaging to the liver, as is pyrazinamide. Um, so you've got to really monitor these patients on these treatments, monitor their LFTs. Um, and if their LFTs are rising too much or they're becoming unwell from a acute sort of liver point of view, you might have to think about switching drugs around or reducing the doses of them. <laughs> 
Okay, so that comes to the end of our session. Um, if you've got any more questions, please pop them into the chat. Um, and please fill in the feedback form if you could. That would be really helpful. Um, it really helps us going forward and helps us to sort of toggle the sessions and make changes if there were things that you guys thought we could do differently or better. Um, and please spread the word round to your friends as well if you found this session useful. Yep, so I've put the link in the chat as well. Um, you'll get access to the slides um, once you fill in the feedback form. So there's a link to the slides right at the end of the form. And thank you guys for attending. You guys, our next session is on cardiology, which is at the end of the month. So we'll be putting that out on social media quite soon. Um, but I look forward to seeing you all again. Well, if there's no questions, I guess we can go to life. Great. Have you finished the recording?